Welcome back to Hover Unbox. Today we are taking a look at nine custom designed GeForce RTX 4070 graphics cards. And for reference, I've also included NVIDIA's Founders Edition model. I'll be comparing stuff like specs, thermals, power, clocks, and of course, we'll do some noise normalized testing. So we have a lot to go over. But before we get into it, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Newegg and their incredibly quick and easy to navigate website, which I've used to purchase a lot of the hardware we use for testing, such as this motherboard. I also often find myself using Newegg for our cost per frame data as they offer competitive pricing and a quick and easy way to find exactly what I'm looking for. In my opinion, the website is by far the best for finding various PC components such as graphics cards, it's easy to filter searches, compare prices, and find great combo deals. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so as I said, there is a lot to go over. So without wasting any time, let's take a brief look at each of the models that we're gonna be testing, and then we'll jump into the results. First up, we should probably go over NVIDIA's Founders Edition version of the RTX 4070, because I guess that's sort of a reference model, or at the very least, a performance benchmark. It's also the smallest graphics card featured in this roundup, though thankfully it's not the only dual slot model. For many of you, the Founders Edition version will be irrelevant as you simply can't buy it. For example, it's not available here in Australia, and I believe this is the case for most other regions. And even availability in the US seems sketchy, and it's certainly much easier to buy from one of NVIDIA's partners. Which is a shame as I believe the FE is one of the best looking and highest quality models out there, though I suppose depending on your needs, it's certainly not the best. And one graphics card that is a lot easier to find online is the ASUS RTX 4070 Dual OC, and it can be purchased down under. It's an MSRP model, which means it costs the same $600 US as NVIDIA's FE version, and when compared to many other partner models, the Dual looks very compact, but it's actually much taller and even longer than NVIDIA's FE model. That said, it is 17% lighter at 915 grams. Now, ASUS has opted not to use the 12-pin high-powered connector and instead is stuck with the more traditional 8-pin connector, of which this card requires just one. And this is the same configuration that almost all other custom RTX 4070s have gone with. Then, as the name would suggest, this is a dual fan model, and ASUS hasn't included dual BIOS functionality, so it's only dual fan, not dual BIOS. Then, the big gun from ASUS for this roundup is the Tough Gaming OC, and right away, I have to admit, this is probably going to be my personal favourite, just in terms of design and appearance. Unfortunately, though, it is a little bit pricey at $640 US, so $40 over the MSRP, not too bad, but that does get you an all-metal design with the only plastic coming from the fans, which makes sense. Structurally though, this is a very solid card, and all that aluminium, it leads to a very premium look and feel. Asus has again gone with a single 8-pin power connector, and you get the standard I.O. configuration, which includes just a single HDMI output and three display ports, and this very same configuration has been used by all graphics cards in this roundup. Then at 301mm long, it's one of the longest RTX 4070s on the market, and it's also one of the heaviest at 1156 grams. So we're dealing with a very big cooler here, which should result in excellent thermal performance. Next up, we have the Galax X Gamer White, though this time uh, I have to confess to it being probably one of my least favorite looking models of this roundup, at least in terms of the design. Now, while I appreciate and like the fact that this is a white graphics card and they can be quite rare, the plastic fan shroud, it looks very cheap and tacky in my opinion, and while the all-metal backplate is nice, and again, it is in white, the black details, which are a bit random and all over the place, they just spoil it for me. That and the unnecessary labels, which could be hidden away on the underside of the card near the PCI Express connector. So the EX Gamer White, it does win points for the more unique white design, but then loses those points for doing it a bit poorly. It's also a very expensive graphics card at $660 US, and for that you don't even get dual bars functionality. And again, the plastic shroud just looks a bit cheap and out of place for what is meant to be a premium product. Now from Gigabyte, we have two models, the most expensive of which is the Eagle OC at $620 US, so still quite an affordable RTX 4070. The Eagle is an interesting graphics card, as in it manages to cram three fans into a 261mm long card, making it shorter than the ASUS dual model. In terms of weight, it's also similar to the ASUS card at 919 grams. Gigabyte has gone with a plastic fan shroud, which looks okay, not amazing, and the aluminium backplate also looks decent. Though I'm not sure the random lines and shapes really work, they're not very 
eagerly, if you will. The GeForce RTX branding on every surface also spoils the design, and I imagine this is an annoying requirement from NVIDIA, as we see this on pretty much all of their partner cards. And it's a requirement that they don't enforce on their own founders edition model, and that card looks a lot cleaner for it. The Gigabyte WinForce is an almost identical product to that of the Eagle, though there are some small, very small changes, I should say, to the cooler PCB, and then of course the fan shroud and backplate. As a result, the physical dimensions are the same, but the WinForce model weighs roughly 40 grams less, so very small difference there. But the most obvious difference is, of course, the color. Whereas the Eagle is gray, the WinForce is a blacked out product, which I'm sure many of you will prefer. I also feel the cleaner and simpler backplate design looks better. So based on looks alone, I'd go with the WinForce. That said, you do lose dual bar support, and that's a feature that is present on the Eagle. Now, the flagship model from MSI is the Gaming X Trio, and this is by far the largest and heaviest RTX 4070 we have on hand. It measures 338 millimeters long and tips the scales at 1214 grams. The heatsink is massive, again, by far the biggest of any of the coolers seen in this roundup. The metal backplate features a huge cutout for airflow, and recessed within the cooler is a 12 pin high powered connector. The fan shroud has been constructed from plastic and it looks nice enough and features a few cool RGB highlights. Overall, an aggressive but clean looking graphics card that I expect to perform very well. Also on the menu from MSI is the Ventus 3X, a base model MSRP card which can also be purchased as a much more compact dual fan 2X model, also at the $600 US MSRP. Sadly though, MSI didn't include the 2X model, so for those of you interested in that particular version, I can't tell you if it's worth buying or not. It could be good or it could be garbage. Don't know, you'd have to take a bit of a gamble on that one. The Ventus 3X though is a decent MSRP card and I'd say the bulk of MSI's budget for developing this product has been spent on the cooler, which is a good thing. That said, we do miss out on dual bar support and the backplate kind of sucks as it's an all plastic design. That's something I wish we'd stop seeing from brands like MSI as it really cheapens their products. And I wouldn't be surprised if cooling performance was actually improved by removing the plastic backplate. Now, the most basic of all the graphics cards featured in this roundup is the PNY Jewel, a dual fan RTX 4070. And that's about all I've got to say about that. It's a very bland OEM looking graphics card, which I suppose isn't necessarily a bad thing. It measures 248 millimeters long, which is just five millimeters shorter than the FE model. It's the lightest of all the RTX 4070s we have on hand at just 688 grams. There's no dual bar support, but it is an MSRP model, so it sells for $600 US. But like I said, extremely basic. Then the last model we have to look at is the Zotac Gaming Amp Aero, which measures 308 millimeters long and weighs 1146 grams. It's a very unique looking graphics card, and while opinions will vary here, I think it does look impressive, especially when powered up. The only real issue I see with this product is the price. At $670 US, it's the most expensive model in our roundup, so the performance would need to be a bit special to justify the asking price. And speaking of which, let's move on for a quick specs comparison, and then we'll jump into the benchmark results. Of the nine AIB models included, four of them are available at the MSRP, and based on what we just saw, most of them look pretty decent. But of course, how they perform is the most important thing, and we'll get to that in a moment. The ASUS Tough Gaming looks to be a really compelling offering, even at $640 US, and MSI's Gaming X Trio should also be good at $650. I'm less convinced regarding the Galax X Gamer, and I'm unsure of the Zotac Gaming Amp Aero at $670. So let's take a look at the test system specs, and then we'll get into the benchmark data. For testing, all graphics cards were installed inside an ATX case with the doors closed at a room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. The exact same conditions were maintained for all testing, and each result was recorded after 30 minutes of load in the same game, again under the same conditions. So with that, let's get into the data. First up, here's a look at the stock out of the box performance. So no changes to the cards have been made, and we're using the default BIOS profile for models with a dual BIOS feature. Of the models tested, the MSI Gaming X Trio provided the best results at just 58 degrees, and impressively it achieved this with a fan speed of just 900 RPM, the lowest fan speed of any card tested. Then we have the ASUS Tough Gaming and Gigabyte Eagle with the second lowest junction temperatures, peaking at just 60 degrees. 
They were followed by the Galax Gamer and Asus Dual at 61 degrees, the Zotac Gaming at 63 degrees, Gigabyte Wind Force and MSI Ventus at 64 degrees, Founders Edition at 65 degrees, and the PNY Dual reaching 66 degrees. This means for the average temperature seen across the GPU die, we're looking at just an 8 degree variance between the worst and best models, though the fan speed does vary as much as 1000 RPM. But of course we'll do some noise normalized testing in a moment. Now when it comes to the hotspot temperatures, the MSI Gaming X Trail was again the best, peaking at just 69 degrees, which is a nice result you could say. Then we have both ASUS models peaking at 71 degrees, though the more compact dual version did require a higher fan speed. The Galax Gamer and Gigabyte Eagle models also performed really well at 72 degrees and 73 degrees respectively. Then we jump up to 77 degrees for the MSI Ventus 3X and Zotac AMP models. Nvidia's FE and Gigabyte's Windforce peaked at 79 degrees, and again the PNY Jewel was the hottest at 80 degrees, which is still a very acceptable result. Now the biggest temperature variance is seen when looking at memory temperatures, and we have some surprising results here. Firstly, and least surprising of all, is MSI's Gaming X Trio with the best result at just 62 degrees. But what was surprising were the Gigabyte cards. Gigabyte's Eagle was the next best with a peak memory temperature of just 66 degrees, followed by the Galax Gamer and then Gigabyte's Windforce at 68 degrees. Then in the middle of the pack is Nvidia's FE model, along with the ASUS Tough Gaming, both of which peaked at 72 degrees. The worst results came from the ASUS Dual, PNY Dual, and MSI Ventus 3X, all of which reached 78 degrees, which is still an acceptable result, but it is quite a bit hotter than the sub 70 degree models from Gigabyte and Galax. Okay, so with all models now noise normalized to 40 decibels, we find that for the junction temperature, the MSI Gaming X Trio is by far and away the best performer of the bunch, peaking at just 49 degrees. Then we have the ASUS Tough Gaming, which also performed really well, despite running four degrees hotter. After that we have the ASUS Dual, MSI Ventus 3X and Zotac Amp all delivering highly respectable results at 57 degrees. Meanwhile Gigabyte's best performing model here is the Eagle hitting 59 degrees along with the Galax Gamer, and then reaching 62 degrees is Nvidia's FE model, PNY Dual and Gigabyte Windforce. Next we have the hotspot temperatures, and again the MSI Gaming X Trio was the best here, peaking at just 59 degrees, which is a remarkably low hotspot temperature. And this is all made more impressive when you realize that it was one of the highest boosting models at 2805 megahertz. Again, the ASUS Tough Gaming also performed really well despite running four degrees hotter than the MSI model. 63 degrees is still a very low hotspot temperature. Most of the models tested landed in the 70 to 71 degree range, and this includes the Galax Gamer, MSI Ventus, Zotac Amp, and Gigabyte Eagle. Then at 75 degrees, we have the NVIDIA Founders Edition and PNY models, and at 77 degrees, the Gigabyte Windforce turned in the worst hotspot temperature. Then finally, we have the noise normalized memory temperatures, and the MSI Gaming X Trio again provided by far the best result with a peak memory temperature of just 52 degrees, which is again remarkably low. Next best was the ASUS Tough Gaming at 62 degrees, followed by the Gigabyte Eagle, Galax Gamer, and Gigabyte Windforce at 64 degrees. Zotac's AMP hit 66 degrees, Nvidia's FE 68 degrees, and the MSI Ventus 70 degrees. Then the worst two results came from the ASUS Dual at 72 degrees, and the PMY Dual at 74 degrees. But again, both are acceptable results. So there you have it. If you're after the absolute best performance, the MSI Gaming X Trio does look to be a safe bet, and it was certainly the best performer of this bunch. There's no doubt other RTX 4070 models out there that'll give this thing a run for its money, but sadly I was unable to acquire them for this roundup. Gigabyte just seemed uninterested in promoting their high-end RTX 4070 products, so we couldn't get the Aorus Master in time for this testing. The ASUS Strix model also wasn't available at the time of making this content, and as a result ASUS were unable to get us a sample. That said, it's on sale now, though it's $750 US, I can't imagine it had come anywhere near close to justifying that price tag. The Zotac Gaming Amp Aero looks really nice with some fancy RGB effects, but only mediocre performance makes it difficult to justify the $670 US asking price. It's certainly not a bad product, at the right price it is well worth considering, so if pricing does differ in your region, be sure to check it out.
The Galax X Gamer White is a tougher sell in my opinion. The performance was decent, though it was often matched by MSRP models, and other than the white design, it really has little going for it at $660 US. Of the MSRP models, I really liked the ASUS Jewel. It's a compact, simple looking card that offers great performance and all the basics such as dual BIOS and a metal backplate. On that note, the MSI Ventus 3X performs well enough at $600, but the plastic backplate and lack of dual BIOS support is quite disappointing. I'd say my personal favourite of this roundup is the ASUS Tough Gaming. It's a bit cheaper than the MSI Gaming X Trio, and performance is still extremely impressive, certainly good enough. It's also a bit more compact, and I like the fact that it uses the 8-pin power connector. And of course, what really gets it over the line for me is that all-metal design. Seeing ASUS do away with the plastic fan shroud for the Tough Gaming is great, and it makes it look and feel like the most expensive model of our roundup which is impressive given that it costs just $40 over the MSRP. Still, picking between the Tough Gaming and Gaming X Tro isn't going to be easy. They're both exceptionally good RTX 4070 graphics cards. Of course, Nvidia's own Founders Edition model is hard to beat at $600, and I don't feel like anything does, at least not convincingly, but sadly, most of you won't have access to Nvidia's own version. Anyway, that's been our look at as many RTX 4070s as I could get my hands on, and the good news being that there are no duds. There's no models that you should absolutely avoid at all costs like we've seen in previous roundups. Not of RTX 4070s, but other roundups over the years, there's been the odd bad graphics card. So no duds here, which is always nice to see. And if you enjoyed this content, please do give it a thumbs up. It was quite a bit of work, and I would like to start doing more of these GPU roundups, but yeah, we're, we're struggling for GPUs that are worth rounding out. Maybe 7900 XT at the newer, lower price point. That could be worth doing a roundup on those. Let me know what you guys think in the chat. And if there are any current generation GPUs that you think are worthy of, of having a graphics card roundup. But yeah, I think we're pretty going to be pretty hard pressed on that one. Anyway, that will do it for this one. If you'd like to become more involved with the channel, get some really cool perks in return. We do have Float Plane or Patreon. Either of those will give you access to some cool stuff like our exclusive Discord server for members only, monthly live stream, behind the scenes content and Q&A stuff. So check that out if you're interested, but if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.